Um, Hi. Hi, Jeff. Hi. Oh, I'm just going to stay in. Uh, How's it going? Okay, good. You're working on what? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm working on my um, bullet grids. Very good. Just like, <laughs> I'm discussing why I'm so violent. Oh, oh. <laughs> I just walked in for that moment. What do you get me then? You got coils. Oh, coils okay. and flatbread, your favourite. <laughs> you get mangled. <laughs> yeah, I've got this great kebab shop opposite our studios, which is our favourite place anyway, before we even got these studios. I've got a phone call from the um, washing machine people. Yeah, that's all right. Um, so it's coming at 5.20. <laughs> Perfectly bad timing, but never mind. Maybe it was a collaboration between Tilda Swinton and myself. Tilda at the time was like an art house movie star. She had a cult following and people were saying, oh, bring me, bring me back a stocking or, <laughs> or a relic of Tilda, because, you know, she had that mystique. And then I had this idea of the relic, the idea of things belonging to people who are long dead. And so there was 30-odd objects that were all in their own individual glass cases, some of them together, like Queen Victoria's stocking next to Wesley's spurs or Faraday's spark apparatus next to Babbage's brain. <laughs> and then there was Tilda as herself in a glass case. So she was sleeping for eight hours a day for seven days. She just lay asleep in the glass case. And so the maybe was sort of not necessarily about Tilda's place in posterity, but about us all, really, that we're all still alive. Tilda was still alive and breathing the same way we were, but was absent because she was asleep. Yeah, I wear these gloves just because uh, the lead's poisonous, obviously. I um, don't want to be any more brain damaged than I already am. <laughs> I should call this the long-winded bullet. <laughs> this definitely reminds, reminds me of doing samplers at school um, when I was at primary school. You know, we'd always have to take a little square of linen and uh, do rows and rows of different stitches. Sometimes being an artist or you know, making art is just, you know, I'd rather you just called it, I don't know, something else, you know. You, can, you know, people think you're on some elevated plane, which you're not, you know, you're just doing, um, you know, I suppose a quite privileged activity. Um, and, uh, you know, but you, you, you don't want to set yourself apart from society, you know, you, you're very much part of society. I was kind of quite an insular child, really. I'm much more gregarious now, but as a child I was very sort of introverted and shy. And, um, and I thought art oh, was about being in the studio in an interior world. And gradually, as I've become more extrovert over the years uh, um, and gone out into the world, then you end up having these conversations with people about, um, I'm an artist, and they'll say, oh, what materials do you use? You're a sculptor, you know. They'll say, oh, do you use clay, or do you carve, or do you... You know, they, they're, they're wanting you to talk about your traditional craft and, and how you how you spent your years um, perfecting it. And I try and explain the materials I use and you know the way I work. And then they get caught up with, oh, you blew a shed up, or you you threw something off a cliff, and and, and, and they get transported by that process. But they, you know, and then they forget about the art bit, which is quite nice. I think it's good to forget about the art bit, really. One of the people who's had been the biggest influence on me in my work has been Duchamp. He made a piece where he draped a mile of string over a surrealist exhibition, obscuring everybody else's work. And, <laughs> um, and I love this piece. Uh, it's a very naughty piece of sabotage, and I've always wanted to reenact it. 
I did a piece where I borrowed Rodin's The Kiss. What I did was tie the mylar string around the heads of the two lovers, binding them together. And instead of the kiss, I called it the distance, and in brackets, a kiss with string attached. <laughs> so then the piece became more about relationships, perhaps intimacies, about, you know, the cords that bind you together can also suffocate you. Hello. Hi. Hello. Good evening. Hi. Hello. How are you? Good. How are you doing? Good. Sometimes before an exhibition you've got this big rush of creativity and you're trying to get things out in time to show and, and some of the things just fall away. I'm in that stage now that I've, I'm firing on all cylinders but <laughs> I realise I should just be concentrating on a couple of things and doing them well. This is basically another of my bullet drawings but they're like sutures, you mm -hmm. know, so they're more like... A, Stitches. stitches and then but I quite like the back mm. and so it, I wanted to be able to show both the back and the front mm -hmm. you know or have the option of a frame where you know um, you, you, both those possibilities are there okay so. it's strangely actually quite beautiful and elegant actually yeah it's kind of curious isn't yeah it? isn't it it's a great relief when I come here I, I associate this place with happiness because I've resolved something enough to bring it to Keith for him to to give it the the best possible presentation. So yeah, no, it's 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 a nice feeling. I've done some um, bullet drawings before, which were um, like wire meshes that were trapped between two sheets of glass. Which um, Keith was brilliant in solving that problem. And this is uh, another way. So this is another way to sh that you can see from both sides. Sold. That's good. I like that. I'm going to show this instead. Actually, yeah. this is a much better idea. It's got a ticket saying sold on it. <laughs> For a long time, I made work that was ephemeral and didn't survive. Basically because I didn't want to be even thinking about commerce when I was making work. Gradually, I think, over time, realise that collectors are custodians of your work. And so I kind of got a little bit more grown up about allowing the work to be sold and collected. This is a photograph taken in Jerusalem, but okay. just outside in the courtyard of the, um, the, the Holy Sepulchre, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Yep, yep. And this is on a, um, a round uh, metal bathysphere thing, which is a, a bomb disposal unit where they put suspect, suspect parcels. Last year I had three trips to Jerusalem, and Bethlehem, and the West Bank, and being part of a big exhibition there. And I made some work which a couple of pieces are going to be in the show. So that's a spilt milk in Jerusalem. Yeah. And this is um, an oil stain in Bethlehem. Okay. I think so being an artist is a political act. But I, I like to wear my politics lightly, I think. I don't want to box myself into a corner with my work. I wanted to keep my freedoms and, uh, and I want the work to have duality. Oh, great. Yeah, look good. If you have too overtly a political point, then it closes down the possibilities of the work. There's going to be a suite of 12 photographs which I took of Pentonville prison wall, which builders were filling the cracks in the walls of the prison outside. And these looked like fantastic abstract expressionist paintings to me. I just visually responded to them because they reminded me of things that already existed in the world which was art um, but these weren't meant as art this was just some filling cracks I took the prison photographs last year and this is you know a few months on and I'm now hanging outside the women's prison, <laughs> hoping somebody's going to come over the top. I've only seen these cracks when I've been speeding by in the car on the way to the Waitrose, <laughs> as you do. Oh. Yeah, nice. Mm. 
Yeah, very different from the boys' prison wall. <laughs> well, it's just got a whole different mood. It's much more delicate. There's no prison cell block H here. A bit more feminine. Yeah. Might be a projection on my behalf, though. <laughs> Were you aware of a moment where you had earned the right to be an artist? Uh, well, I think I've always thought of myself as being an artist, even though, I mean, whether anybody else thinks I'm an artist or not, but it felt, I felt comfortable in the role. Um, so I feel I've mostly been an artist always. But, you know, it doesn't mean that my art's any good. <laughs> Um, no, I, I, I'm, I think I've done. I've made some good art. I made some bad art too, but um, I try hard to make good art. I won't know really until I've printed one or two of these up if, if they're going to work or whether they, you know, I'm just photographing pretty patterns. I think it's because the pretty patterns are on a, a prison wall. Exciting as this one. Yeah, this one was very exciting. I mean, this is all. This show is all about the British art collection. You know what the tapes owns. You know, but, um, being a mother certainly changed the attitude of my work. I mean, I was pretty well established when Lily was born, um, so it wasn't a major setback to my career. And it was fantastic in a way because it allowed me to become a child again. Hey, that's great. There, that looks good. Yeah. So revisiting the cracks in the pavement and all kinds of things, I think it's made quite a lot of difference to the way I view the world. Oh look, we oh, don't look, no. <laughs> no, it's nice view of uh, Alison's bottom. <laughs> Actually, there's not much art you could say that <laughs> includes an elephant's bottom. But it'd be amazing if there were. I expected to live a life of penury and make art as some kind of philosophical you know, reason for being and, and not expecting to, to make a living out of it. This is really brilliant. I love her stuff. I sometimes have to pinch myself that I have had work on display here, but it's, you know, familiarity makes it less scary. So I'm pretty happy that I've got, you know, quite a few works in the collection here. My dreams have come true, which is quite weird, really. <laughs> it's lovely, that one, isn't it? Yeah. Let's go and see the rest of the show, shall we? Mm -hmm.